My name is Darian Stanford. 45 years ago, the Gallup poll asked Americans across all 50 states a question. Do you think marijuana should be legal or not? And in 1969, the answer to that question, as you might imagine, was a resounding no, it shouldn't be. 84% of the population or respondents said do not legalize it, and 12% said yes. Now, if you do the math, there's 4% who apparently couldn't make up their minds in there. Fast forward to 2013, and last year, Gallup asked the same question of Americans across all 50 states. Do you think marijuana should be legal or not? And the answer to the question in 2013 was an unequivocal yes. 58% of respondents said marijuana should be legal, and only 39% said that it should not. Again, you have like three to four percent of the people who still haven't made up their minds after 45 years, I guess. But that is a remarkable shift. How did that happen? I can tell you how it didn't happen. We don't have a massive increase in the number of people experimenting with marijuana or using marijuana. The percentage of the population that identifies themselves as having tried marijuana has stayed the same since the mid-1980s. It's around 35%. So if this increase is not attributable to more people using, then it must be coming from people who don't use marijuana, maybe never have used marijuana. And in fact, that's right. So I want to talk to you about Oregon, which of course is why we're here in Ballot Measure 91. I want to talk to you about who is behind Measure 91 and reasons why that support is there. Approximately 150,000 people in Oregon signed the initial petition to regulate, legalize, and tax marijuana in Oregon. And then after that happened, a diverse group, a diverse array of people and organizations from all across the political spectrum, this is not a Democrat-Republican issue, so from across the political spectrum, they took a look at this 36-page initiative that went through 50 drafts and was written by teams of people in different fields, and they came to the conclusion that this is the right thing to do. The Oregonian, the Eugene Register Guard, the Portland City Club, multiple senior citizen organizations, labor unions, social workers, the former United States Attorney for the state of Oregon, who would have been the chief federal law enforcement officer in the state, former head of mental health and rehabilitation services for Oregon, former Oregon Supreme Court Justice, and me don't really include myself in that, the list of people whose qualifications I just went over, but I'm an Oregon lawyer. I've been an Oregon lawyer for about 15 years now, and uh, five of those years were as a prosecutor in Multnomah County. Uh, I now live in Washington County, not terribly far from here. I live in Oak Hills, so I'm going to have to ask all of you afterwards about the food here and whether this is someplace I'll take my kids. Uh, but I'm also a parent. I just mentioned my kids. I have three children, ages 6, 8, and 11, two girls and a boy. I teach Sunday school, I coach soccer. I don't do drugs and never have, don't really intend to. If you would have told me 10 years ago that I would be standing in front of a group of people advocating for the legalization of marijuana, I'd have told you you were crazy. And here I am. And I would encourage every one of you in this room to take a look at the facts and to join me in that support for Measure 91. And now I want to talk to you about the why. The current system that we have is a failure. It is broken. Marijuana, the federal government, as many of you know, has treated marijuana as a Schedule I drug since the Nixon administration in the 70s. It means it's equally dangerous with heroin and more dangerous than methamphetamine and cocaine. And that's nonsensical. It it, that, that isn't supported by science in any way, shape, or form. But before we in Oregon sit on our high horses and look and mock the federal system, let's take a look at what we are doing here. What's going on? It is true that in Oregon it is a violation, not a crime, it's like a speeding ticket, to possess less than an ounce of marijuana. But where do you legally get that marijuana that it's just a violation to possess? Because it's general, generally illegal to grow it, buy it, sell it, you can't bring it in from Washington. So the system that we have set up is effectively saying commit a crime to get the marijuana that it's only a violation to possess. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but one group that it does make sense to are those that are benefiting directly from it most right now, and that's the Mexican drug cartels, who are here and who peddle marijuana. 
They don't really care if it's legal to deliver it or not, and they're the ones that are presently profiting. Let's talk a little bit more about Oregon, and there's a perception out there that we're going to talk more about today that marijuana isn't really a big deal in this state. We don't spend a lot of resources on it, we don't spend a lot of time on it, so, you know, come on, we're, we're not saving resources with it. The numbers, and these numbers I believe have already been presented to you in informational packets, these numbers suggest otherwise. They, they don't suggest otherwise, they scream otherwise. According to the Oregon State Police, last year there were 10,500 adult arrests, and arrest is the term that the Oregon State Police used, for marijuana. That number has been consistent over each of the last several years. And if you expand the category from arrest to offense, it jumps from to 14,000 to 17,000 a year. According to the FBI, 7% of all arrests or detentions in Oregon are related to marijuana possession. And of all drug-related contacts between officers and citizens in the state, more than half are for marijuana. More than meth, more than cocaine, more than heroin. Over the last decade, there have been 10,000, I'm sorry, just under 100,000 adult arrests or citations for marijuana. That's pretty much the population of the city of Albany. So go in and arrest the entire city. That's what's happened. That's one arrest or detention every 39 minutes. So during the course of this debate, it'll happen twice, statistically. And if you are a person of color, you are twice as likely to be arrested or detained for marijuana, even though use among the races seems to be proportionally similar. I want to be clear about something. The, you will see the data, and the term arrest is the term that is used by the Oregon State Police. At the same time, though, if it, is, it is possible that that term, it would make sense that that term would include citations or detentions where an officer, like a traffic ticket, is spending time talking with people. Whatever the case, it is a tremendous amount of time that is right now going into marijuana enforcement in Oregon. And it's time that we simply don't have and shouldn't be using on marijuana. If each site or detention is approximately 10 minutes in length, and I think that's a low estimate, we're talking about two straight years of police time on marijuana. It doesn't make sense to do that. Resources are limited and should be redirected towards far more significant issues, unsolved murders, untested rape kits, missing children, identity theft. These are the types of things we shouldn't be wasting our money on marijuana. We shouldn't be wasting time on marijuana. It should be redirected elsewhere. I want to talk just briefly then about another extremely significant topic, obviously, and that's kids. Let's talk about kids in this measure. As I mentioned, I'm a parent. I have kids ages 6, 8, and 11. And I do not want my kids using marijuana. This is something I've thought a lot about here. The idea that Measure 91 is going to introduce marijuana to kids and normalize it and increase use here is preposterous. Marijuana is here. And there's, it, Measure 91 doesn't change that. The current criminal system has it here. Studies by Columbia University and elsewhere indicate that kids report that it is easier for them to buy marijuana, most kids report it's easier for them to buy marijuana than it is for them to buy either alcohol or tobacco. And where are they getting this marijuana from right now? They're buying it from the guy under the bleachers. And the guy under the bleachers gets it from the Mexican drug cartels. And you know what? When you go get that marijuana under the bleachers from the guy who gets it from the cartels, he's got some other items in his other pocket that he could peddle to you as well. That's the methamphetamine and that's the cocaine. Right now, licensed shopkeepers who sell alcohol or tobacco, they have a very strong incentive to not let kids buy alcohol or tobacco. They face significant fines, they face criminal prosecution, they face loss of their businesses if they do. The guy under the bleachers and the drug cartels, they don't ID. They don't really care. The present system that we have, controlled by a, the criminal element, is failing kids. It is a far better system for us to regulate, tax, and educate. And I want to point you to Colorado for that. Colorado legalized approximately two years ago, and we have some data coming in. Reports are in Colorado that young people, kids now, post-legalization, 
have identified, let me, let me make sure I'm saying this accurately, the number of kids, the percentage of kids who identify marijuana use as a risky behavior, as a high risk behavior, has gone up after legalization. There is more education. And with education, there are results. And you can also look and see that use among teens and kids in Colorado has gone down. I don't want to be misleading. It is from 22% to 20% is the study. So in terms of statistical significance, is that statistically significant or not? Everybody can decide for themselves. But what is clear is that two years into legalization, it sure as heck has not gone up. Education regulation works. And that's the system that Measure 91, that's the system that Measure 91 presents. Measure 91 legalizes, regulates taxes. Estimates are between 18 to 40 million in new money to Oregon as a result of this measure. 40% to schools, 35% to state and local law enforcement, and 25% to drug prevention and rehabilitation. That's money that is being taken from cartels' pockets and put to use for the people of Oregon. And that is a system that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for the cramped conditions, but uh, Josh Marquis, I think, does anyone not know Josh Marquis in the room? I think Josh needs no introduction, though. Um, thank you. I'll do a little introducing on my own. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. My name is Josh Marquis. For almost 21 years now, I've been the district attorney in Clatsop County. Um, I, I know Darian, and I respect the five years he spent in the DA's office. This is my life. This is not something I'm just visiting on my way to a much more expensive and, and well-paying field of law. There's nothing wrong with that. Both John and Darian are defense attorneys. I make my living off good defense attorneys. But um, there are several things. The one I need to talk about right away is you need to know that the people behind the Yes campaign are out-of-state billionaires. Now, however you may feel about, say, Merkley and Weeby, I happen to support Merkley, there is about $3 billion of what's called dark money from some people called the Koch brothers who are very conservative. And they've dumped it into Oregon. And a lot of people are offended by that, and I understand why. It's not illegal. It just is kind of smelly money. Well, guess what? You can go on the Secretary of State's website and you can read about where the money for New Approach Oregon is coming from. 90% of it is coming from the Drug Policy Alliance and organizations sponsored by George Soros's and Peter Lewis, who was the owner of Progressive Insurance and died recently. Millions and millions of dollars. So I've got a couple of handouts. That's because the No campaign is outspent about 35 to 1 by the Yes campaign. I'm here on my own dime today. I'm paying for my own gas. And although you are buying me a Coke, I appreciate it. Let's just start off with a couple. I am disappointed that Darian, a lawyer, would tell you such a whopper about the number of people arrested. Arrested has a term of art for, for John and Darian and me. It means a free ride in a police car. It means getting handcuffed, and it means getting a criminal record. And how many people here have got, not gotten that, but gotten a speeding ticket or a tarp parking ticket? I'm surprised not more. It was unpleasant, wasn't it? The, the red and blue lights came on, the officer pulled you over, said he wanted to see your driver's license, said you were going seven miles over the limit, wrote you a ticket. Probably, as he says, less than 10 minutes. Exactly the same process for 90% of the marijuana arrests. What they're relying on is the fact that the poor Oregon State Police have to report to the, the FBI. And Oregon has been such a progressive state for 40 years. For 40 years, ladies and gentlemen, we have not arrested people for less than what is currently about $200 worth of marijuana. And who started that? A district attorney named Pat Horton, who I worked for in 1973 in Eugene, Oregon. He said, this is crazy to make felons out of people with a joint of marijuana. So in Oregon, we aren't spending $10 million. We're not, they, by the way, are claiming we're spending $50 million a year. I'll give you a good idea. In my county, which is substantially smaller than Washington, but is a mid-sized county, we have approximately um, 500 felonies I file a year. So I asked the Criminal Justice Commission, how many um, misdemeanors did I file last year? I mean, how many, I'm sorry, marijuana cases did I file? The answer was three. Three out of 500. And what happened to them? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on a couple of people. There's 14,600 people in prison in Oregon. You all have heard of the drug war. Sir, you, uh, the beard right there. How many people do you think are in prison for marijuana in Oregon? Marijuana-related charges. Directly for marijuana. Yep. Uh, secondarily, I think a whole lot more than you're, 
No, but for, and for selling marijuana, possessing marijuana, just give me a number, I guess. Okay. How about for drugs overall? Any kind of drug? 30%. Okay. The real number is 7%. Oregon has the second lowest drug incarceration rate in the country. You know how many are there for marijuana? 100. And they're all there except one for selling, ironically, to kids, which even measure 91 wouldn't change. So the fact of the matter is we are spending maybe one quarter of 1% of our law enforcement revenue. If Measure 91 passes, and again, I don't have a lot of the fancy things, but in Colorado and Washington, where, by the way, this is not working out at all, I've been to Colorado, there are 600 marijuana retail outlets in Colorado. Marijuana is being smoked on the street. Police officers are arresting them for it. I watched it happen. Um, it's not working well. In Colorado, you can have one ounce. If Measure 91 passes, some of you see this, you can have eight ounces, half a pound. Oh, no, we're not done. You can have more than a half a gallon of liquids. Oh, we're not done yet. You can have a pound of edibles, and you can have an ounce of hash oil, and each adult household can grow four plants. And by the way, if they grow that inside, it's going to take the same electricity as 29 refrigerators. That's just going to be great for our environment. The fact is that the current Mexican drug cartels are not supplying the marijuana for Oregon. I, I see I'm running out of time, but I want to tell you an anecdote. I have represented for 17 years this state on the National District Attorneys Association Board. And several years ago, I went down to the DEA headquarters in Tucson, where they have this like NORAD-like center, and they have drones and these huge screens. And, and at the time, people, Mexican cartels were doing, and they still are involved in human smuggling. And they were making people carry these burlap bags of 50, 60 pounds of marijuana over. And because we were law enforcement, we were allowed in. We had lanyards around, but it didn't have my name. It just said clear DEA on it. And I'm sitting there poking at this big, I'm thinking. And the guy comes up to me and says, I'm going to guess you're from Oregon or Washington. And I said, I hadn't said a word. I said, how do you know where I'm from? He says, let me guess, you think this is real crap, don't you? I said, yeah. I said, I wouldn't have bought this when I was a freshman at the U of O. And he said, and I said, how did you know where I was from? He said, because the marijuana you grow is so much better than the marijuana that's exported from Mexico that nobody will buy Mexican marijuana, essentially, in, in Oregon or Washington. I said, well, where does this go? Michigan, Indiana. The numbers that Darian cited you are broad national statistics. Oregon has been a leader for 40 years in being rational about marijuana. It is not reefer madness. I will tell you, personally, I think it's less toxic than alcohol. I think it's less addicting than nicotine. But I don't think there's any question that if every adult can have a half a pound of, the, of weed and an ounce of hash oil and a pound of edibles and a half gallon of liquid, what we will do, as we would if we dropped the price of beer, wine, or even soda pop, is you're going to further destigmatize the drug, you're going to make it more available to more people, and frankly, I don't give a crap whether adults smoke marijuana at home. The law enforcement priorities of this county and my county and the state of Oregon reflect that. And, and be very careful when they tell you, oh, there's arrests, because the arrests imply that the entire criminal justice system is involved, that the police officer arrests that person, that I prosecute them, that they go to jail, that they're in prison, or, or at least in jail. None of that is true. You have no criminal record for possession. Of, if, if you're filling out a job application and you have managed to rack up three marijuana citations, which some people do, and you're asked, have you ever been arrested for crime? You know what the answer is? No. You have not. The other thing is, I urge you to look at this measure. It's got some real doozies in it. Even though you can possess eight ounces, it doesn't even become a misdemeanor until you're up to a full pound. So 15 ounces is a lot of marijuana. Um, also, the medical marijuana law in Oregon will be unaffected. So the 65,000 people with medical marijuana cards, they're going to continue to be able to possess a pound and a half in addition to all this. Do we really want a lot more? And this is a drug. Is it, is it a terribly addictive drug? No. Is it more dangerous than OxyContin or alcohol? No, it's not. But we have an opportunity here to be rational about our drug policy. Now, there are states that are not rational. They throw people in prison for possessing small amounts of marijuana. I think that's silly. I also think the classification of marijuana as a Schedule II drug is silly. But the idea of making it wildly available is going to cause two things that scare the crap out of me as a prosecutor. Access to kids, who will also see it as, well, hey, everybody's doing it. That's the way kids operate. And the other is driving under the influence of it. I see my time is up, at least by the way I measured it. So.
told I have two minutes, so I'll, I'll try to scramble through a couple of notes here. First and foremost is if you listen to the same presentation that I just listened to, and obviously Josh has done presentations forever and is very good at it, but if you listen to it, you heard some things. We don't really arrest people for marijuana that much over the last 40 years, like three out of 500, I forget what that stat was from. Uh, we, I, he doesn't care if we do it at home. Uh, very few people in jail. It's not to less toxic than alcohol, less addicted than nicotine. What are we doing? Why are we having this debate? Let's legalize this now and actually capture revenue and use that revenue for schools, for education, and to actually fund treatment programs that work at, reduce it, at reducing real drug problems. We might as well. Right now, we're just letting cartels control that, and we're not capturing any of this revenue that could be redirected more appropriately. In terms of Colorado, a couple of points about Colorado. Uh, you know, Twain says, lies, damn lies, and statistics, I believe is his, is his phrase. There are plenty, there's plenty of evidence that Colorado is a tremendous success. The Brookings, Inst Brookings Institute has come out and said, Colorado experiment is a success. And perhaps there's no better indicator of success in Colorado and how it's gone than the fact that the governor of Colorado was originally opposed to the measure. And then he has considered evidence and he has come out and said he likes it. It is making sense. Adult use is not up. Teen use, kid use is not up. Traffic fatalities are not up. In fact, they're down to historic lows. So ask the governor of Colorado what his thoughts are in terms of the success there. Uh, Mr. Marquis talked about the arrest figure. Look at the data that we've provided. The Oregon State Police uses the term arrests. It must include other items, and I believe I addressed that in my opening remarks. Access to kids, I want to be clear about something. I said this in my original remarks, and this is the last thing I'm going to say on rebuttal because it is so critically important. The current criminal system that we have in place gives kids all the access they could possibly need. Again, it's the guy under the bleachers and the cartels selling unregulated, unlicensed, unpackaged marijuana. That's what's happening right now. Under this system, it is controlled, legalized, regulated, tested, and there is money to go to education programs about it. In Colorado, that started to pay off, and we need to be doing the same thing here. Well, let's talk briefly about what the, what the, what's happened in Oregon. There, is, there were marijuana initiatives in 1986. They said no. 1998, they said no. They, the only thing they said yes to ever was the medical, Oregon medical marijuana. 2004, they said no. 2010, you all said no. And two years ago, you said no. The only difference is this mega money from outside. And again, no one says, oh, it's, it's an arrest. You call it an arrest. No, it's not. An arrest is a term of art. It means something. We're not spending money. Criminal means something. Both these lawyers can tell you afterwards. There's felonies, there's misdemeanors, and there's infractions. You don't have to worry about an infraction on your record. You do have to worry about a misdemeanor or a felony. This idea that it's being sold under the lockers. Let's talk about here in Washington County. Your district attorney, Bob Herman, who's one of the people who joins with me in saying no on 91, um, went after a couple medical marijuana outfits that were going forward and in fact trans shipping it to places like Texas because they could make so much money. Think of how much, if, if each patient gets a pound and a half, you would have to be zorked 24 hours a day, seven days a week for about six weeks. And if you ever fell down to that dreadful level of only having a pound of marijuana on hand, you could have more. Is Colorado a success? You know what? Let's talk about polls. A poll was just taken three weeks ago in Colorado. 52% of Coloradoans now wish they'd voted the other way. The district attorney of Denver, a good friend of mine named Mitch Morrissey, this is a bleeping disaster. Um, they have had the number of marijuana showing up in car crashes is doubled. And I I, the only thing I can take from Darian's claim is that, 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 that fatalities are down. For one thing, you have to look at macro data, not just micro data. There are a lot of other things that affect it. Is I suppose he's arguing that people on marijuana somehow drive better. I've actually had that argument made to me. That's insane. You don't want to be driving under the influence of too much caffeine, too much Benadryl, or too much anything else. Again, I'd ask you to look at this measure and ask why, for example, does it say it's no longer going to be a crime to smuggle marijuana into a prison, youth facility, or jail? That's section 55. It's well hidden. Well, 
thank you, um, and thank you for being here. It's, it's, it's hard for people to insert themselves in the public debate because sometimes you're subject to um, personal attacks and things like that. So I thank both parties for coming here. Now this is the time we have questions. Josh has told me that he's got to be out of here at one, so uh, thereabouts. So I'm going to take it upon myself to limit questions a little bit. By the way, the gentleman with the beard is Steve Buckstein, the Cascade Policy Institute, and you ask him about statistics. I don't think he wanted to be held to them because that's his job. Um, but in any event, I did, and he acknowledged he didn't know them either. So, so he was. But in any event, um, <coughs> forum members, identify yourself, ask the question, concise, direct, and one question if possible. And it could be either party can respond to it. Would you like to sit over here to, to avoid sure, moving around? Probably don't want to carry us to camera, so I'll have them sit over here, which are means you I'll sit behind. Some direct, questions to us, direct questions to the parties, or if you want both people to, to um, uh, answer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rob Solomon. I'm a forum member, and thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. And my question actually is to both of you. I'm a little confused when I listen to the no argument, especially today, when you talk about the amount that people can have. I actually would agree that it's a rather large amount, but people are also saying it's less dangerous than alcohol, and I don't see any regulations on how much alcohol people can buy. Just would appreciate your comments on that. Thank you. Let me respond because I think it's sort of aimed at me. Um, we have an opportunity for the for one of the first times to make a intelligent decision about psychoactive drugs. We did not make an intelligent decision in 1922 when we abolished alcohol overnight. That's what prohibition was. Alcohol went from being completely legal, and I'm sorry, ladies, but the real reason is suff universal suff suffrage. The women who got the vote universally in 1922 were also temperance advocates. So they came in, they pushed it in. It was a disaster. It didn't work. And now, what is probably the worst drug in our society? I think Darian and I would agree it's alcohol. So we have loosened, particularly in this state, up the ability uh, how much marijuana can people have? Are they sick? Can they have just about as much as they want? So this is a drug. I mean, ask anybody. I know there are some, some treatment people in this room. Ask them if it's just a benign weed like oregano. It's not. Eight ounces is a hell of a lot of weed. When I smoked marijuana, when I was a freshman at the U of O, it was called a lid. Some of you might remember that. And you bought it for about 10 or 15 bucks. And I had to smoke an entire joint to get high. As my wife points out, who sort of disagrees with me about this subject, if I smoked an entire joint of today's marijuana, I'd be puking for two and a half hours, and then I'd probably have the equivalent of a psychedelic experience like Maureen Dowd had when she ate a candy bar in Denver. So I think the point is, we have an opportunity here to draw the line and say, let's have a rational policy. We do have a rational policy. We don't make criminals or felons out of people possessing use amounts of marijuana in the state. Brief response is, uh, you're right. We don't control how much, where, where, sorry, where'd you go? We don't control how much alcohol that somebody can buy. Uh, uh, we don't. And it is less harmful and less, I agree completely with what he said. Marijuana is far less harmful and less dangerous. So uh, this idea, here's something that's, that's missing. Right now under the current system, the marijuana that's being peddled out there, Lord knows what's in it. Lord knows what the content is. Lord knows anything. Under Measure 91, it is tested, it is controlled, it is labeled, it is child-proofed. These are measures that make a lot of sense. And in terms of specific regulations, there's a cautionary element built into this 36-page bill that I included, inclu in, 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 initiative, I should say, that I encourage everybody to read. And that is, is that the OLCC is specifically prescribed to take a year and think hard about what rules make sense, and they have decades of institutional experience on this issue, and they can apply that experience to promulgate restrictions in advertising, et cetera. John Blackman, forum member. Uh, my question is to both of you gentlemen. I'm reading a handout apparently from the Oregon State Police. And unless I'm reading wrong, there are more than 15,000 arrests for marijuana. Does the Oregon police not know what an arrest is? Thank you. <laughs> yes, I will, because I could show you the email from the Oregon State Police. Here's the problem. Um, as a lifelong law enforcement person, I have 28 years, of, with all due respect, a little bit more than Darian, 
Every single law enforcement agency in the United States has to report to something called uniform crime reports. And they class, most states do not have the liberal laws we have for infractions. So they have a category called behavioral crimes. The Oregon State Police, they've ignored it, have written several emails to them saying, quit calling them their arrests. They're not, they're citations. And by the way, uh, he's talked about, oh, there's all these safeguards. I urge you to read this bill. There's not a darn thing in there about, oh, how it should be packaged or how it should be kept away from kids. It's, it's sort of, a, we're from the government, trust us. I am the government and I'm not that confident of you trusting me. And how did Cover Oregon work out for all of you? That was the Oregon Health Authority, a quarter billion dollar disaster. And what a great job the OLCC is doing of keeping alcohol from our children in Oregon. We're not having any problem with binge drinking. My God, in my community, something like 33% of 11th graders have binge drink in the last 30 days. There is nothing in this measure that says anything other than you can have up to 15 ounces without having any kind of criminal. And, and, and again, I would urge Darian to contradict me as a lawyer that an infraction means no arrest, no jail, and no record. The question was about the term arrests, correct? That's what the original question was. You have the data in front of you. The Oregon State Police in that statistic used the term arrests. I w and it's somehow different than offenses. I was careful, I believe, in my opening remarks to say this can include merely citations. I, it's strange that the state police would use the term, but at the same time it can include, it might include citations, probably does include citations in time. But think about it. You know, when's the last time, I think Mr. Marquis asked when you got a traffic ticket, and most people raised their hand, I had to raise my hand. How long does that take? That's not a short encounter. That is, let's pretend that there's not a single person going to jail, which is not backed up by the data, but let's just pretend it is merely traffic sites. Think about all the time. Time is a precious resource that officers have limited time, and we are using it 10,500 times for marijuana? when there are so many other more pressing issues, and it's 15,000, 17,000 if you include, expand the category to include arrests. So whatever you wanna say about the Oregon State Police's numbers, we are not being smart with how we use our time and we need to be far smarter. I think if there was anything else about that, that's it for now, that, that's, that's all I'll say. We need to be smarter. We need to direct it towards more serious, significant offenses and raise money to fund and educate those offenses. And in terms of the, I think Mr. Marquis made a, a few points about there are no safeguards. Again, he can say stuff, I can say stuff, we can get up here. Read please for yourselves. Take a look at the bill, or the, the, the initiative and look at it for yourself. And you can see the OLCC has a year and there is there are input potentials for citizens to come in and say we should do this, we should do this. We get more, another year of data from Washington and Colorado to see what works and what doesn't. We get the benefit of going third. We get to see things. And there are going to be hiccups different places, but again, overall, both places have been successful. We can look, we can study, we can be cautious, and we can be smart, and that's what we're doing. You don't write everything into the bill. You give an institution with institutional memory and integrity and experience the ability to promulgate these safeguard regulations. Steve Buckstein, member of the forum, and for full disclosure, my organization, Cascade Policy Institute, has come out in favor of this measure. We've been neutral on previous ones because we thought there were more negatives on balance than positives. In this one, we see some negatives. Um, we don't think marijuana should be taxed any differently than any other product. Um, but it is what hasn't been said here for people to know the difference. As I understand it, Measure 91 is a statutory measure. And when the two major gubernatorial candidates say that you know, they're not in favor of this, they think we should wait to see what happens in Colorado and Washington, we can make changes if, it's, if we get some things wrong. But to me, the main argument in favor of this, and I'd like to hear the responses, is that it's a civil liberties issue. In America, adults have the right to put whatever they want into their mind. They should have the right to put whatever they want into their body as long as they're not harming someone else. This measure allows more freedom for individuals to make that choice. It's not a choice I would make. I would try to talk my friends out of it. But it's their choice, not ours. And I think when it's legalized, you do have some quality control, which you don't have now. In, after prohibition, the, the 
potency of alcohol went down during prohibition, uh, the district attorney is right. You know, kids could get it anywhere because the the drug cartels and those those cases the you know the, the bootleggers were peddling to kids. That's what's happening now with marijuana. So I guess I guess my question is. Um, address the, the civil liberties issue. Do people have a right, without being arrested or detained or whatever you call it, uh, to put marijuana in their body as long as they're not harming someone else? Thank you. It sounded a little bit more like a speech than a question, Steve, but that's okay. Um, you know, as you probably know, the Cascade Policy Institute, I think it's fair to say, is a libertarian organization. Is that a... Libertarians take the position, generally, that it's basically none of the government's business unless it's something, as Will Rogers says, my right to swing my fist ends where your nose begins. And that's sort of the general concept of the criminal law, which is until it affects somebody else. Unfortunately, the people that are bankrolling Darien's side, also the Drug Policy Alliance, also don't believe heroin use should be against the law or methamphetamine use. And I would get, make a wild guess that the Cascade Institute probably believes that too, under the theory that maybe selling it should be illegal, but the mere consumption of a substance is up to a person. I, I'm kind of a libertarian, but not that much of one. And the problem is that when people, let, let's give you the difference in, I assume some of you has used marijuana. I'm not going to embarrass you by asking, but some of you probably use alcohol. My wife, who's against generally my position, pointed out to me, she said, well, you've got a point. She says, when I drink a couple glasses of wine, I can be kind of mellowed out, but I can titrate the dosage. Anybody who smoked marijuana knows there's no such thing as a halfway measure. You smoke marijuana, kabam, in about 30 seconds, you are stoned. And just think about whether you want people like that dispensing your medication, driving your school bus piloting an airplane. Uh, by the way, it's extremely difficult to test for THC because it has a special thing that's fat soluble. And I want to respond to one other thing because Darren, Darren's using a classic lawyer's argument saying, oh, it's, it's there in the state police reports. Well, the fact is it's not an arrest and PolitiFact, and I see a reporter from the Oregonian in the back there, um, did a, they have a thing where they'll check the accuracy. Very early on in this campaign, I challenged them on that and you can go anywhere from True, mostly true, half true, mostly false to false. There is one called pants on fire. They judged this 10,000 claim false. And I urge you to look at it. You can go on the Oregonian's website. It is a lie and it's an important lie because it's meaning to trick you into believing that we are spending vast amounts of money trying to control marijuana. When in fact, not all these safeguards he's talking about are not in the bill. I agree with him. I think you should read it. It's gonna be quite an interesting read. Time out just for a second. Let's be crystal clear about something. There is not a single person, there's not a single part of this bill, there's nobody that's standing up in front of you, and God knows it isn't me, talking about legalization of methamphetamine and heroin. Uh, the harm is incredibly different to society, to individuals, the addictive nature. I've seen that. And yes, I, have not, I was not a prosecutor for 28 years, but I was in Multnomah County for five, and most of that in the drug unit, where I saw the effects of those drugs as compared to marijuana and others. And so I do have experience to speak and I'm very proud of my time as a district attorney there. Nobody is up here. Don't, don't let the straw arguments uh, evolve that meth and heroin are next. Absolutely not. There is no slippery slope here. Marijuana is absolutely different. And this idea that we're gonna have people driving buses using marijuana uh, or, or planes using marijuana, et cetera. We don't, the current system, we, we could have that now. Measure 91 doesn't say you can do this. The workplace has the right to control what you can or cannot consume. And so this idea that everybody's going to be coming to work smoking weed, there's no public use for it in any way, shape, or form. I think that's specifically written into the measure, and that's the way it should be. Again, you as an employer are going to have the right to control your workplace. So this idea that people are going to be out smoking at work, it's, it's a false argument. Don't, don't buy into that sort of a scare tactic. I don't believe that there's anything else that I can say up here about the Oregon State Police reports. You have it in front of you. I believe that I have said each time that I've stepped up here that what this term arrest may or may not include, and it can include just detentions, but I'm going to repeat it again. 10,500 of these, whatever they are, they're called arrests here, maybe the Oregon State Police have clarified, that is officer time directed towards marijuana, and it should be directed towards more serious offenses, unsolved murders, identity theft, missing children. Let's use resources more smartly, and that's what Measure 91 does. 
I would just say that um, we usually limit the, the form of the questions. Unfortunately, I wedged myself back there and I couldn't escape. And you know, lawyers have an in inherent sense of balance. And uh, I told them two minutes per response and, and, and question. So I'm going to sit over there so I actually can enforce it. You know, lawyers without rules are sort of like um, the Lord of the Flies. So <laughs> each of them's looking at me. Do I get more than two? More than two? So uh, I will be sitting here. So I could, but I didn't want to push through the, the, to get there. Do you have your red John? Screen? Pardon? I'm using, I, I, I'm being facetious to explain why I was sitting there when I said I wouldn't, so. And that, that probably, uh, John McWilliam is for a member, and that probably you should go for questions, too. That uh, yeah. questions that are real long probably can get red, red, the red sign. Uh, anyway, again, uh, John McWilliam is for a member. Uh, I'm a little concerned about uh, children, uh, children um, even high school age. And it was mentioned a little earlier about getting uh, maybe some purchasing uh, under the bleachers and places like that for the kids. Well, uh, does this have any effect on that? And uh, what about the price of marijuana? Will the black market undercut the price that the uh, state's selling for, and then they'll sell it for less? And that's really the both of you, so I, I don't know who's really going to want to address that. But yeah, John, I'll go first. Thanks. Thanks. <coughs> Well, let, again, I'll be clear. I'm a parent, and I'm very concerned about kids, too. And the current criminal system, kid marijuana use, is enormous. So I'm going to repeat, Measure 91 does not make this a new problem. It is here, and it is something that needs to be addressed, and we're failing our kids now under the current system. What, they're have, what they have right now is they are buying it, again, from the guy under the bleachers. And that's, the, that's, that's an image, but I can picture the guy right now. He's the guy with the mustache driving to the eighth grade, um, which is unusual. But uh, that's who's buying it now, and he's getting it from the cartels. And what they're selling, they're also able to market specifically towards kids in terms of edibles and other things to attract them. And then, again, marijuana, or marijuana in one pocket, meth and cocaine in the other one. This is a problem that exists now that the current system is failing to address. Under Measure 91, we control, we regulate, we test. Do we have packaging? There, 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 it is marijuana. This is from Colorado, I believe. Here's an example. Um, I've got the other one. Here's an example, and I'll leave this up here for anybody to look at. Childproof packaging. Uh, it's, it's not clear, you can't see through it, it's controlled, it's tested, and there are money, there's education that comes in, education dollars that come in to let kids know. I don't want my kids using marijuana, but the current system is failing them. I would rather have a system where messages that are getting out, let's educate, let's talk, parents talk to your kids about marijuana, Let's have it tested, controlled, regulated. Let's take it out of the cartel hands. Let's take it out of the guy under the bleachers' hands. You ask also, I want to make sure I'm answering your question. Uh, uh, you know, it is illegal to, to buy or sell to somebody under 21. That would continue to be the rule with marijuana. No question about that. Um, you talked about the price. You know, well, aren't the cartels going to continue to exist? And I guess what I would respond to there is, uh, there, uh, no, they won't. And it might not be an immediate instantaneous effect, but how many bootleggers of whiskey and such do you still see selling that could go make their private distillery and go peddle it? That's not happening anymore. And so the market has a remarkable way of figuring out the appropriate price. And people generally, I'm not talking about kids because they are not allowed to, but people generally would rather buy something legally than going to get it from the guy under the bleachers or somebody illegal. Darian, and, uh, um, and I have bad news for him because if this passes, his kids are going to have a lot more access to marijuana. You, you don't have to be a parent to know that most children model their behavior on, on what they see either as their role models, which hopefully are their parents, or unfortunately celebrities. There's no stigma attached to marijuana in our culture. In fact, quite the opposite. You're very unhip and unsquare if you don't brag like uh, Whoopi Goldberg that she's in love with her vapo pen. That's a way to consume marijuana without actually making smoke. This is the article, by the way. It's in the July 20th Oregonian. When is a marijuana arrest not an arrest? The ruling, although the number is listed in the state report is confusing, officials have clarified the record. Said, cited it any other way is false, as in not true. Now, I've been to Colorado I don't, in the last couple of months. Maybe, I, you know, 
I never saw anything that remotely, and I did go to a couple marijuana stores. I didn't buy anything. I asked a couple interesting questions. I said, I, I told them mostly the truth. I said, it was about 40 years since I'd smoked. And, you know, what did they recommend? They said, not the gummy bears. I said, well, the gummy bears, are, by the way, are gummy bears. I said, well, why not the gummy bears? Says, well, what we do is we spray them with THC oil that's as much as 80 or 90% THC. And if you're a newbie and you consume that much marijuana, you're going to have the equivalent of a bad acid trip. So I said, well, okay, well, how much marijuana would you recommend I buy? He said, about two grams. There are 28 grams in an ounce. So there is no way, for one thing, there is nothing in this law that does other things saying, oh, don't worry, some agency of the state government, the one that brought you cover Oregon, is going to come up with some rules and they'll fix everything, so don't, don't worry about it. Even Steve, I think, as a libertarian, would be really leery about sort of, you know, don't, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And by the way, what I said about the Drug Policy Alliance is the people bankrolling this, go to their website. It's called drugpolicyalliance.org. Read what they have to say. They believe firmly that there, there is no drug whose possession. Now, it may well be that Darian doesn't believe that. Um, and I don't think heroin and methamphetamine are in, this, in the same, you know, category as marijuana. But the point is, this is, is a drug. It is not simply a harmless herb, and there are some serious downsides to it. Thank you for being, <coughs> being here this afternoon. My name is Jerry Arnold. I'm a former member. I was looking at the Yes on 91 literature, and I noticed it says, the current failed approach to marijuana in Oregon supports a dangerous system of drug cartels. I haven't heard anything about the drug cartels. Uh, there's no evidence here. Is it anecdotal information? Do you have some statistics that say it's drug cartels are being supported in Oregon? Thank you. Um, I know from my time as a prosecutor in the drug unit that I did have experience in trying to prosecute some of these cartels that are over here from Mexico. I will also, probably the most efficient thing for me to do would be to direct your attention to a six or seven part Oregonian series about the presence of cartels in Oregon that ran in 2013. And you can see in there that these are people that are here, the weapons and tools that they have, they're violent, they're uh, pipe bomb and can be. Uh, a, couple, a year or so ago, a couple years ago, was associated with one of the drug cartels, and they are the ones that have come in and set up marijuana grows on public lands uh, around Oregon. There was like a 91,000 plant grow that I believe was perhaps in Wallawa County. They had sophistic oper sophisticated operations set up around Hermiston. So their presence is very real. They're here. They're involved in marijuana, methamphetamine, and cocaine. Look, check out the Oregonian series. Let me directly respond to that. I was a prosecutor in Eugene, Oregon. Then I was the chief deputy DA in Newport, Oregon. Then I was the chief deputy DA in Deschutes in Bend. And for 21 years, I've been the district attorney in Clatsop County. And I've prosecuted every kind of drug case you can imagine. I've even been a special federal prosecutor handling marijuana cases. And by the way, the, the, the threshold for marijuana cases in the U.S. Attorney's Office is it has to be a thousand plants or they're not interested, in, which is millions and millions of dollars worth. I have never seen a cartel involved in marijuana production in Oregon. There, there are very much cartels, and primarily because methamphetamine is no longer manufactured in Oregon. Heroin is not manufactured in Oregon. There most, almost all the heroin and meth is manufactured south of the border, and these cartels are really scary. They've developed a very good system, and although occasionally you'll see them sell marijuana, for all the reasons I told you that story about the DEA center in Tucson, the, the, I'm sorry, but you're, if your kids are buying marijuana, they're buying it from their friends. It's called weed for a reason. My wife's a master gardener, and she has this greenhouse room in the back, and she grows tomatoes there right now. And I got a lot of flack for this, but I will say it again, and Ian, you're welcome to use it. And that is, if my wife wanted to, and I didn't object, and 91 passed, she could grow some awesome weed. It would not be that hard for her to do, and it wouldn't be. And this idea, by the way, that most people are going to go to stores is ludicrous. When I was in Colorado, I asked the people selling it to me. Um, I said, where are more of your customers from? He kind of smiled. He says, they're people like you from out of state. Chris Leslie, former member. I've had experience with uh, friends growing six-foot plant weeds in their basement. This is California, different state, so I've changed since then. The idea that uh, a weed is a weed, or a drug is a drug is a drug, and is harmful. Uh, this is not politically correct, but when I was a little kid, they used to call it the Mexican disease in Texas. Or it, 
more commonly known as local weed. How can anything that, uh, and you're both lawyers, and I'm sure some, you already won admitted that you smoke weed. Did it help your grades? 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Did it help your grades? And how do you feel? I think it's child abuse to tell kids that they ins it's legal for adults to smoke weed, just like alcohol. They still get it. How are you going to stop them from getting weed? Well, since I'm the only one that admitted I smoke weed, let me answer that question. It was, it was about 40 years ago, and I just didn't like it very much, so I didn't continue using it. And yeah, if I'd, I have friends at the U of O who I say, you know, lived in a purple haze on a couch, and some of them are still on that same couch in a purple haze. Um, you know, did they become, you know, terrible, dangerous people? No. Um, I used to write speeches for my boss 40 years ago who was advocating decriminalization. To be fair, marijuana was demonized in the 1930s and 40s. It was a highly racist campaign directed primarily at African Americans and at Mexicans to make it sound like it was sort of, and some of you may have seen a movie that you can get on Netflix called Reefer Madness. It's ridiculous. Uh, marijuana is not that dangerous, but it is a drug. And one, there's no doubt that if we, I mean, in a state that has already had the most rational policy in the country for 40 years, we do not jail or incarcerate people with, you know, use amounts of marijuana and haven't for, you know, two generations to say, okay, we're going to kick the doors open. Every adult can have eight ounces plus a half a gallon plus an ounce of ash oil plus, 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 plus. You have to think, of, I, I think it's just, I mean, do, Am I crazy about adults, you know, having large amounts of alcohol and making it available to kids? No, it does a hell of a lot more damage. But we are at a point where we can develop rational policy. I think we have a rational policy now. And frankly, one of the things I don't think Darian is being driven by this. He is a criminal defense lawyer, so I guess some of his cases come from people we charge. But I doubt if he gets very much business from people possessing less than an ounce. Well, actually, they're not even entitled to a court-appointed lawyer because they can't go to jail for it. Um, but the fact of the matter is that there are people who will make millions of dollars. If you don't like big pharma, and you don't like big tobacco, and you don't like big oil, you're not going to like big marijuana either. First of all, I'm not a criminal defense lawyer. It's not what I do. I actually uh, make a living bringing cases involving elder abuse and suing big insurance companies that don't provide the coverage that they promise to provide. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not doing criminal defense work right now. Uh, not that there's anything wrong at all with it. I, I, I enjoy it immensely. Um, and it's an incredibly important part of the system, but it's, it's actually just, to be accurate, not what I'm doing. Um, to, to respond to your question again, I think one of the most important things to remember is that the problems that you're identifying about kid use and dangerous use exist under the current system. And what the evidence that I've seen shows, again, y we have alcohol is legal for people 21 and over, tobacco is legal for people 18 and over. We tell kids, yes, it's legal for us, but don't use it. I is that a mixed message? No, because if you, again, look, I'll direct you, and I can, I can show you this numbers from Columbia University about how where we have something that's legal for adults, but not for kids, and we put money towards it, and we use education, and we talk to them, have honest conversations with kids about these topics, the kids reported it's easier to get marijuana than it is to get uh, tobacco or alcohol. And so what I'm advocating to protect my kids, you can't put them in a bubble, but it is a smarter use of our limited resources to have a system that's controlled, regulated, and taxed, and talk to kids honestly. The results show. The uh, one other point to respond to just very briefly is, the, is the, this home grow idea. Everybody's going to be out doing a home grow. Does anybody here drink wine? Does anybody here drink beer? Do you have a vineyard in your backyard? Do you have a distillery? Do you have a brewery in your basement? Or do you go to the store and buy something that's controlled, tested, and you know the quality of what you're going to get? The same is true for marijuana. This will be the last question. I've been accused of being a criminal defense lawyer, and I <laughs> guess there's no other. God, God, plead guilty. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lee. Uh, Lee Coleman, forum member. Uh, one of the, at least one of the local communities, city councils, has proposed a sales tax on uh, marijuana sales, and the, you know, that could become rampant throughout the state if, if this measure does pass. Question is, does the measure preempt local taxation? Yes or no? The short answer is 
short answer is yes, it does. And the reason that you see city council scrambling to do it is a very, very thorny legal argument. It was, in fairness, and, and Darian can explain why, in Colorado, there's quite a bit of tax. If you try to buy marijuana in the Colorado, what they call retail system, it costs between $22 and $35 a gram, not an ounce. There's 28 ounces in a gram, so at $20 a gram, that's 560 bucks an ounce. And the answer to your question is, no, you don't make beer and wine at home, but marijuana, you grow it, and you pluck it off the tree, and you roll it up and dry it, and you smoke it. It's, it's probably the simplest drug of every drug from OxyContin, alcohol, Xanax, and everything else. You just, it is a plant. Um, and you, know, you can get the, you can, just like oregano is a plant, except oregano doesn't have a psychoactive drug. It's like hemp. It's actually the female of hemp, except you can smoke all the hemp you want. You won't get any THC out of it. That's the difference. But to answer your question, what's happening is a number of cities are scrambling, hoping that if they get in before the bill passes, that they can put a tax on it. Now, I'll let Darian answer, because he's one of the drafters, or at least doing it, but it's very clear that they intended, in order, in fairness, to keep the price of, of legal marijuana down and competitive with the cartels or the people lurching, leaking underneath the bleachers, i.e. your neighbors, uh, from selling it. Because in Colorado and, and Washington, the price is really, really high. But the fact of the matter is, I suspect there's going to be, your cities are going to be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars each fighting with big marijuana to object to those taxes. Sure. Uh, it's prohibited. It, uh, the taxation system that was just talked about is absolutely prohibited. And so, no, it would not be allowed. There's a taxation system that's set up. I can, you can look at the bill and see the specific numbers. Uh, what is going to happen is that this money that comes from Measure 91 is going to be returned to the state and local law enforcement, 35%, 40% to schools, which spills down to the local level, 25% towards drug prevention and rehabilitation programs. Again, spilling down to the local revenue, to the local level. That's what's going to happen with the tax money, and that's all beneficial. Big marijuana, that's the cartels right now. Let's change it and let's make it Oregon. Thank you very much. This is the end of our television program. The Washington County Public Affairs Forum is a service of Washington County Public Affairs Forum, and it's run by its members who elect its officers. I'm the president um, for now. We've got additional programs coming on board. We've got um, the con first congressional district candidate, Suzanne Bonamich and Jason Yates, next week. Then on the 13th, we've got State Treasurer Ted Wheeler with his school initiative, and Steve Buckstein will be um, opposing that before us. And Measure 88 is the alien legislation license, and that's Jim Ludwig and a representative CASA. So thank you for your time and attention. Both parties said they would stick around for questions if you wanted to but we're going off the uh, television right now, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Anybody want to chat with these individuals or are they free to leave? They're free to leave. <laughs>